award-nominated adult film star Rachel Starr in her hometown of Dallas, Texas. On site at the historic Rosewood Mansion in Uptown Dallas, Rachel opened up with me about business, private life, and views on the performer experience in the adult industry. Join us for this edition of Private Sessions with the incomparable Rachel Starr. you're in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Dallas! So are you a Texas girl I am originally? born and raised, yeah. Oh my gosh. What is it that you love so much about Dallas? Really the southern hospitality more than anything. People are so friendly here. Um, it's almost impossible to go out somewhere, especially in Dallas, um, and not make a friend wherever it is that you are. I don't care if it's a grocery store or if it's at a bar. <laughs> like <laughs> People just talk to each other here, and they're so nice. You know, they open up doors. How are you doing? Can I help you with that? Uh -huh. <laughs> and being that you traveled around the world, really, mm -hmm. for for work and what is it that you found about Dallas that compares to even other cities? I would say that Dallas has a southern hospitality but there's a few places like San Diego for instance um, that reminds me a lot of how the hospitality is here mm -hmm. um, or Sarasota you know Sarasota reminded me Florida uh, reminded me a lot of here um, and then when like Australia, when I went to Australia, I was like, oh, the people are so similar to like Texans. Uh -huh. Um, so there's definitely places that are very familiar as far as like the hospitality aspect, but then there's places like Manhattan where do they have the Southern hospitality? No, because they're super fast paced, but they're still really nice. You know what I mean? They're just like spit it out. I got something to do. <laughs> you know, so they're like rushing you through it. But in their way, they're not trying to be rude. They're like, I just got stuff to do, you know? So, um, yeah, I've been all over the world, but Texas is my heart for sure. So take us back then. You, you've been in the adult industry. We've seen your name all over the place. Mm -hmm. How did you even get your start in adult? Well, um, I was an exotic dancer for five years prior and I was found at a club I was dancing at. One of the directors came in, saw me on stage, gave me his pitch. That's the short of it anyway. <laughs> Otherwise we could be here for a whole interview just on that. Um, but uh, yeah, so he gave me his pitch and I agreed to it. I flew out to LA um, like about a month, month and a half later and got into the porn industry, fell in love with it. I really fell in love with cameras more than anything. Um, I've always been an exhibitionist at heart. Um, so a crowd, an audience, anything like that, I was really good at, which would be a really good exotic dancer. Um, but then I got on set and I'm like, okay, I, don't, I won't have an audience, but then you actually kind of do. You have so many people on set, you know, that there's that. But then there was like this camera lens, kind of like, you know, always two, three feet from my face or something. and there was something about staring in that camera lens that I was like, maybe the people aren't actually here, like right now in this moment, but I knew that that camera lens represented, in my mind back then, I just thought hundreds of people who knew it was gonna be hundreds of thousands or millions of people today, but back then I'm thinking, oh, well technically hundreds of people are still gonna be watching this. Um, so it just fit right in line with my exhibitionism and here I am still 11 and a half years later. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that that lens itself can be addictive? Yes. Yeah. 1000%. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, I can be whoever I want to be in front of that camera. You know, I can be myself, right? Like my normal self. I can be whatever character somebody hires me to do. Um, I can be my alter ego. Um, it really, for me, that lens is a creative outlet to be whatever it is that I feel I want to be in that moment. Being in the industry for 11 years, how do you feel that your business model has continued to evolve even from your early days up until now? I mean, I know that there, there could be a lot between mm. then and now, but how do you feel that has evolved for you and what have you had to do in order to keep your brand out there and keep building essentially? Um, educate myself, massively educate myself. Um, you know, when I came from being an exotic dancer, um, that was like the Facebook and MySpace days, but girls really didn't like promote themselves working that much on, on those. So 
you know, I definitely had to learn all about social media when I got into the industry and about promoting myself, the forums. Um, you really have to project yourself onto those places so you can engage with fans and things like that. And that's very important for the longevity of your brand. And those were all very new to me. Like as a dancer, you have the city that you're dancing in. You kind of are pretty dependent on the people that are in that city for you to make money on. Um, and so that was very new to me. And I had to see, search out a lot on, you know, Google and asking lots of questions, talking to directors, what's important to you? You know, what makes a girl sell? Um, down to the colors that pop on set that, you know, just kind of make you bright and, you know, stand out from the rest. Um, so I constantly, like if anybody I thought was an expert at whatever it is they did, I definitely like would try to sit them down and be like, okay, teach me your ways. How can I incorporate this into my life as talent that makes your job easier and lifts my brand up higher? Would you say that's you in just in general for just anything, as far as anything that you invest your time into, mm -hmm. whether it be business or whatnot, you dig in heels first, get in there and get dirty? Absolutely. I am curiosity killed the cat right here, <laughs> like all the way. Um, I'm a book nerd too. Like um, I've been into self-development for years. So I was already like just trying to make me as a person the best that I could possibly be. But that transfers over into business too. Like how somebody does one thing is usually how they do everything. Um, so I think the fact that I had dug so deep into self-development with things like Tony Robbins, um, seminars and books and stuff like that, that it was just very natural for me to see this as a business and say, okay, I need to dig deep into this and figure out how to make that successful and the best that it can possibly be too. So um, I was always very curious. And that is very apparent too, even as far as social media is concerned, just how important that is to you. Would it be fair to say coming from a whole place? even as far as your approach to your adult career? Is that is that something that takes high priority to you? Absolutely. I, um, I read a ton and I research things a ton just because of the curiosity level, but I also like to share that information with others. Um, and I do feel that being 11 and a half years into this business, I have a certain responsibility to walk the walk and talk the talk and lead by example. Um, I think that's very important to show people that are just getting into the industry how to carry themselves, um, how to promote themselves, how to be a successful star and do it professionally. Um, and to walk the walk and talk the talk and lead by example isn't always the easiest thing <laughs> because yeah, it's way easier to just live the party fast paced life and you know leading by example isn't always doing what's fun but it's doing what's right mm -hmm. and um I think that over the years doing that consistently that has made people feel more open and comfortable to coming to me and talking to me and saying hey you know maybe it's a new girl in the business and she's like you know I want to be as successful as you are and I have a lot of questions I don't know who else to go to and you seem so open mm -hmm. can I have lunch with you can I talk to you can I get your phone number can we talk on Skype or whatever and um, and they want guidance and I think girls that are girls and guys that are trying to really set themselves above and beyond the rest of the crowd, um, it's flattering that they would reach out to me. Did you have any hesitation to really go forward and put yourself out there as far as helping others especially, but even for yourself as for your own brand and your own career? Because a lot of people would tend to shy away from that, being more in the spotlight because of the potential for criticism, the potential for scrutiny. Mm -hmm. Has that something that you take into consideration when you are making moves as far as what you decide to do with your own business and your own brand? Well, I think transparency and vulnerability now in hindsight is the most powerful attributes that I have, but I didn't always feel that way. You know, when I first got in the business, there is so many people that want to drag you down or want to bring you to their level or they're jealous or envious or people out there that are just trolls and they 
attack for whatever reason it is. To this day, I still don't understand why there is so much attacking rather than embracing people. I'm not quite sure what the goal is. Like, okay, you're gonna attack me online and try to tear me apart. And what are you hoping to gain by this? That I'm gonna succumb to whatever you're saying and say, you know what, gosh darn, you're right. Let me just start doing whatever it is that you tell me to do. Cause you know all about me. You're right, yeah. yeah. Like, you yeah. know the business, you know everything, you know the shoes I've walked in. So yeah, let me just take you on as my new leader, you know? Um, but with that being said, you know, um, everybody has walked in their own shoes and we're all, I believe we're all at very different consciousness levels and rather trying to judge the people that have even judged or scrutinized me, try to understand why, you know, what are all of the reasons that they feel it necessary to do that? What are they struggling with internally? What are they struggling struggling with externally? And try to remove myself from taking it personal, but to see it objectively that we're all suffering in some way and we all have struggles. And, you know, there's times that, you know, somebody cuts in front of my car and it, although I would love to say that I'd be like, oh, that's okay. They needed to get there before I did. There's times where I'm like, F asshole, what the f you know? And, you know, they can't hear me. I'm in my car, like in my own commentary. But, you know, there's times where, you know, I'm not the perfect person with the perfect responses or whatnot. But in high insight, I think it's important to be able to take a step back and say, you know what? Scrutiny over the years and judgment over the years has shaped me into having the outlook that I have now. Because everybody wants to feel accepted and everybody wants to feel wanted um, love. They want to feel significance to a certain level. Um, and I believe in my personal opinion that generosity and contribution to others is what has given me my significance before I used to try to get it through. Oh, I'm the best, or I did this, or I did that. And look at these accomplishments when really that was just more scrutiny for somebody to try to tear me down and be like, yeah, but this person did it better, or you don't do this, or you don't do that. When I started coming from a level of just being generous to others and trying to contribute to others, um, whether it's growth, learning, love, acceptance, um, and giving a judge-free zone, a safe place for people to want to come to me that they could tell me anything and I would come with acceptance, that was really where I was like, no, this is what true significance is. This is what true love and connection is. And that definitely like stepped me over that big hill of how do I deal with all this scrutiny? Like, how do I deal with all the judgment? How do I deal with somebody that, you know, they don't know the whole context of my life and how I ended up here and why I stay or where I'm going and what my goals are. And that's okay. It's totally okay for them to have that. Um, but I, I choose to not take it personally and know what my own truth is. Mm -hmm. And for your own sanity, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can see how it can drive performers into even a darker place. It, it, the fact of the matter is, in the adult industry, what, regardless of what capacity you are working, that you are going to be judged or scrutinized at some level or another. Mm -hmm. So support is really important. And it sounds like you are definitely open to sharing and offer your support and share your knowledge to other performers. In the past, whenever people have approached you and seeking guidance or seeking assistance or advice, I mean, what did that look like? Were they newcomers in, in the industry um, or were they you know, already established? Give us an idea of what that has typically looked like for you. Most of the time it's been newcomers, although there has been people that were already in the industry, but maybe they were still new and they were struggling with maybe some of the situations that they were in and didn't feel like they had the right guidance or something in their gut was telling them something's wrong and there could be a better way. Um, and maybe they ended up on set with me or maybe somebody told them that, you know, well, Rachel started as coaching, you know, you should reach out to her. Um, so I get it in various ways now. Um, so really people, it, it really started through osmosis through my social media. Like that's how it all happened was, you know, four or five years ago, people started reaching out to me. I'm going to get in the business or, you know, girls or guys would reach out to me. Like I'm already in the business kind of, um, but I want to take it to the next level. I don't really know what to do or who's the best agent or what's the best company to shoot for. How do I get in contact with them? Or why won't these people hire me? I really want to work for them. And it'd be like, okay, well let's look at that. 
you know, what are your goals? What are you trying to get to? And I, once I figured out that I could, uh, like, once I could figure out what the context of what they wanted was and all of the different angles that they were going at, like, what were the needs that were driving them, then I could help them. Um, some people really just want the fame. Like, that's really all they care about. Some people literally don't care about so much the money of it, but they want the fame. They want the, the notoriety, no, notoriety. Um, and then some people are like, I do not care the amount of followers I have. I don't like, all I care about is getting the highest rate possible. And that's all I care about, you know? And then there's people that are like right in the middle. They're like, I want a little bit of everything. I want longevity. There's people that are like, look, I want to make the most money I can in one year. I have one year to do this. That's it. Well, those are very different business plans that I would give somebody. All of those different people would be very different structured advice. Um, but I think through the years of experience that I have, um, I've seen so many people go so many different ways and I definitely have the, the, the own way that I went through, but I also learn from what my peers do too, where I can say, okay, well, I didn't go that route, but this person did, and this is how she did it. Um, this is how I would critique that. And maybe you could advance even further than what she did by doing this. Um, so it takes a, it really takes more than one sit down with somebody to really understand, okay, what are your goals? What are you trying to get to? What's important to you? What is your current living situation? What is your current financial situation? You know, is your family supportive? Are your friends supportive? Do they even know? Do you feel like sometimes those goals can be more circumstantial than anything, especially for newcomers? Because mm. from what I found in previous experiences is that people enter this industry out of need, out of circumstance. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's, you know, it, it really can depend on Absolutely. where they are? Absolutely. Um, most of the time people are getting into it because they need fast money, um, circumstances of living situations, um, and the environment that they are in and they're trying to pull out of that. Um, so they're definitely trying to level up by getting into the industry. And that's a, whether you're a cam model or um, trying to get into being a porn star. Um, I think that the steps, when people make the decision to get into sex work on any level, um, whether it's camming, exotic dancer, anything like that, right? Um, they are trying to level up out of their current situation that they're already in. Um, and that comes with a whole bag of uh, circumstances <laughs> to work through. Um, but, uh, but as long as someone's open and, you know, you know, I take it on as a huge responsibility that somebody is trusting me enough with very personal information, very personal details about where they came from and where they want to go and what they're willing to do. Um, there's a major amount of responsibility that comes with that amount of trust and, um, sacredness, I guess, of keeping that between me and them as well. Um, so I can help them go forward and I can help them reach those goals. So what is it? I mean, do you really get to know these individuals beside, before deciding to move forward with them as far as, you know, giving them any kind of mentorship or guidance or are you just, you're, you're totally open at this point? I'm very open, um, to however somebody wants to do it. I will say that I've so far and I'm not to say that this is going to stay this way. Somebody could shock me. But um, so far, anybody that has reached out to me, usually it starts out as, okay, this is just what I want to do. How do I get there? Blah, blah, blah. And then as we dig deeper, they realize, oh, okay, well, I need to give you the background on this. Or I need to tell you this situation. And so I do end up getting to know them on a very intimate level that maybe they didn't initially set out for me to know, but they realized pretty quickly that I'm in their corner. Like it doesn't behoove me to coach you and you fail. It behooves me for you to be successful. Um, and move forward. Right. And so with this industry, it takes getting to know somebody on a pretty personal level a lot of times and knowing very intimate details about them so I can help them. Um, that's not to say that somebody couldn't hit me up and everything is perfect as it is and white picket fence everything and they're just like, hey, this is just what I want to do. You don't need to know any of this other stuff and just help me get to where I need to go. I'm open to that too. Why is it important for you to advocate for performers and to essentially assist them knowing that maybe there could be no return promised or guaranteed for mm -hmm. you on your end? 
For me, um, my first year in the business, um, I didn't have anybody to mentor me. Um, I had an agent, but the way that the agents are set up in the industry is very turnkey. It, there's a lot of girls rolling in and they don't really have time to fully mentor you on a really deep personal level. Um, so I felt alone a lot. Um, I felt very alone and I felt like in 2007 when I first got in, it was very competitive, very dog eat dog, and girls were very much pitted against each other as competition. So there wasn't a free space to talk about rates, to talk about what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. What does this agent say versus this agent? Everything was supposed to be like very hush hush, don't share anything with anyone. And that made it very hard to know what was the right direction to go. Um, so I had to have the courage to ask those really hard questions and to start those conversations. And a lot of people were turned off by it, like, oh, you know, we shouldn't be talking about that. But some people did. It was almost kind of like, they were kind of scared to talk to me about it, but you could tell they were almost refreshed. Like, yeah, actually I've been wanting to talk to somebody about this. I just didn't want to get in trouble or I didn't want to, you know, intrude or, you know, it's kind of like this hush hush thing. I didn't know that we could talk about it. Um, so I definitely opened up those platforms and I was the curiosity that killed the cat. I was like, I've got to figure out all the aspects of this industry. I've got to figure it out so I can figure out how to be successful. And then as I started figuring it out, I started seeing other girls struggle in different areas um, with agents and directors and different people that they worked with. I noticed that people were working with people they didn't want to work with. People were doing things probably sooner than what they originally would have agreed to if it was their choice. They kind of felt a lot of pressure to do certain things. Um, some people were doing things for rates that they thought they just had to accept. They didn't know that they could get higher rates. Um, and I started looking at that and saying, this is wrong. This, this is, this is a bad, this is a bad path. Like there's got to be a better way than this. And so I, I felt it was like my personal duty, not only for my own brand, um, to figure out what's the right path for me, but how can I make this better? How can this, this should, transparency should be the number one thing in this industry, especially when you're being so intimate, you're sharing such an intimate part of yourself. You're exploiting your body for the entire world to see that's never going to go anywhere. That's permanently on the internet forever. You're agreeing to exploit your body to the world forever, permanent imprint, and there's not transparency in every single aspect. This has got to change. So needless to say, do you feel like for a newcomer, especially entering the adult industry at whatever capacity at present day, that whole experience hasn't really changed or evolved since 2007 when you entered? Very little. Very little. Um, I do think that it's gotten better around, around 2014, 2015. I started to notice more girls were communicating, more guys were communicating with each other. Girls and guys are communicating with each other. Directors are starting to communicate, PAs, photographers. Um, there's a lot more talk about people being more open with their rates um, and what they're charging for things. Um, what one agent says to them and what another one says. Um, contracts are being more transparent. Um, people are sharing contracts with each other, whether they're supposed to or not supposed to. A lot of people are saying, hey, I know you got a contract with this company. This is what mine says. What did your say? Um, and that takes a lot of courage for people to kind of break those rules and say, you know what? Like, I feel this is the right thing to do and I just want to be transparent and I want to succeed out of the pigeonholed place that we have been for so long. I do think that we have many more years to go and it's gonna take more people standing up and wanting to be transparent. But like I said, I really wanna lead by example. Um, and I wanna show other people that it can be done. And when you do do it, you are not booted out of the industry. Um, I've been standing up for myself and my rates and um, other girls and transparency and contracts and attorneys and everything under the sun and I've never been booted out. I'm still here, my business is thriving, I'm still at the top of my game. Um, and those are scare tactics um, that are used to repress people from finding out what they could be getting. 
um, which means that's less money in other people's pockets. But I'm all about what's fair. So segueing from that, as far as your actual business model as it is at present day, um, you know, you've integrated, I've, I've, you're, you're doing live cams, you're in film. Um, how, what are the different ways that you've diversified your business? Because also, it seems like a lot of models tend to put all of their eggs in one basket from the get-go. So is it important for you to diversify? And if so, how are you doing that? That is the best question you could have ever asked. I wish more people asked that. You have no idea. <laughs> um, you have to diversify. You have to. Um, if you want longevity, if you want financial freedom, diversity is where it's at. You put all of your eggs in one basket, you are subjecting yourself to all of the regulations of that one industry that could change in an instant. You, um, I mean, look at the industry when I first got in, we didn't have cheap sites, okay? Wasn't even a concern, didn't have to worry about that. Tube sites came out and everyone freaked out and money plummeted and we didn't know what we were gonna do. Thankfully, I had webcam. Um, I also was just as fine, even though I was still a film star, I was totally fine dancing at a strip club as a house dancer, not as a feature, as a house dancer to diversify. Um, I did that for many years, even filming my first three, four years in the business. It was not uncommon for me to still dance at a club three or four nights out of the month just to bring in that extra instant cash. Um, when I got into camming, that was my saving grace. I can't tell you how many times, like, you know, when the industry has uh, been shut down due to an STD, right? Like all filming stops and it could stop for two weeks. It could stop for two months. It could stop for four months. You don't know. And um, what better way to make money when that happens? There's no filming happening, so but you can still get on cam solo, right? In the privacy of your own home, 24 hours out of the day, seven days a week, anywhere in the world that there's an internet connection and a laptop, you can make money. Um, and so why not do that? Why, why give all of your power to one sector of one side of the industry? Um, and, and leave yourself open to so much risk. Diversifying, you know, even say like on a financial statement, the whole point of diversifying your portfolio is to limit your risk, right? It's a big risk getting into the porn industry. It's a risky business. Are you going to be successful? Are people going to like you? Are people going to request you? Um, what if they don't? but you still wanna be a sex worker and you like that sexual freedom of expression, diversify. Maybe you only get two scenes a month, but you can webcam you know, five days a week and you can dance at a strip club or you can waitress or you can do sexting on your phone. Maybe you do phone sex lines. You know, there's all various different ways, and, and I do all of them, by the way. I do the sexting, I do the phone sex, I do the dancing at clubs, I, I'm on webcam, I still film, um, I tour all over the country feature dancing. Um, I really, if there's any part of this business, I do all of it. Do you feel that, especially for film, porn stars, doing something like camming or dancing, you know, that's supplemental, that's more of a second rate, lower rung, kind of thing to do if you're stepping outside of your film career. Do you feel that way? I um, I used to feel that way when I first got started. I will tell you that I make more money camming than I do filming. So, um, but I'm dedicated to it though. So, you know, that's the other thing is I, um, I find a lot of personal freedom in just being able to take my laptop anywhere I want to go and creating my own schedule. And I can, you know, if I want to cam for a few hours, I can make money right now. You know, if somebody cancels a shoot on me, no problem, I don't care. I got my laptop with me, I'm still gonna make money today. Um, but I think in the beginning, um, how can I word this? Girls get used to a fast paced money and they get used to not having to sell themselves. When you're on set, you're on set with five, 10 people maybe you know, someone that's holding the camera, a PA, someone holding the microphone, a makeup artist, various people on set, right? And you're not having to sell them. They're just there to film it, right? They're there to film the magic happen. Right. 
but you, there's no pitching yourself to actually anybody. You receive your check at the end of that shoot, you go home. That's easy money in the grand scheme of things. You may be on set for six, eight, 10 hours, but it's still relatively easy, easy money. Um, when you're on cam, there's a higher level of expertise that you have to come with than just having sex and someone filming it, right? Like we have sex every day, like in our personal lives, everybody knows how to have sex. Yes, you do have to know how to open up for the camera. You may have lines you have to remember, things like that. But in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that difficult. When you're a cam star or if you're an exotic dancer um, or phone sex or something like that, you are you have to learn how to engage that person. One, you have to figure out what is their fantasy. What is it that they want to see? You have to figure out how to keep them there because the longer that they're on the phone with you, the longer they're on cam with you, the longer they're texting you, the more money that you're making, right? But you, the only way that they're going to stay is if you are truly fulfilling their fantasy. Like they have to be getting something out of it. So if you just sit there and think that you're just going to twirl your hair and just look hot and just, you know, just give me all your money. Well, I mean, honey, if you can make it happen, kudos to you. But in my experience, it takes a lot more than twirling hair around your finger and, you know, having your makeup done for people to give you money. You know, you have to engage with them. You have to learn, what is their name? What are they into? Um, you know, do they want you to talk dirty? Do they like thigh highs? You know, do they have a foot fetish? Maybe, you know, they're into big tits. Maybe they're into big ass. Well, you know, what if they're into small tits, but they happen to be in my room and I have big ones? Well, I have to figure out and be able to pull, maybe he's into something else. He came into my room for a minute um, to check it out. Maybe he's into brunettes. Let me figure that out. You have to know how to ask the right questions. You know, so I think that girls that are in film, there's nobody to ask those questions to. There's no one to pull that information out of. You just have a camera and they're saying, we want five positions, make it happen. And in an industry that is so niche oriented to say the least, mm -hmm. I mean, have you figured out what your niche is as far as from your fans point of view, where do you fit in categorically? If you were to categorize yourself, what would those be? Um, in the porn industry, I would say that definitely my ass. Um, I have a big bubble butt um, that I'm known for. Um, and that definitely is what gained my following pretty quick. Um, I do have big tits, which, you know, there are some fans there too. But my body is really fit. Like I've always had like the abs, the tiny waist, you know, the, I guess the hourglass figure is what I'm saying. is like, you know, I had the butt, had the tiny waist, and then I had, you know, the boobs. So I think that's what I'm most known for. Um, although what I'm known for on cam is for that too, but it's slightly different. On cam, if I ask them what's their favorite thing that they love about me, they will tell you the, the dirty talk. The way that I pull them in with my eyes. Um, I do a lot of eye contact with that camera because I want to give them an experience as if I'm really talking to them and it almost feels like they have lost their senses of the rest of the room and they're so engaged in that computer screen that they literally feel like I'm really there. So um, yeah, filming wise, known for my ass, my curves, all of that. Uh, camming is definitely, I would say, the curves, but probably more so my engagement with dirty talking and stuff like that. With cam, I mean, you can dive deep into like the people open up. They mm -hmm. open way up as far as, especially all of these different fetishes that we don't even see on mm -hmm. even film. It makes film, adult film, look almost vanilla in that mm -hmm. aspect. So, have have things caught you up off guard at this point as far as the requests that you Ooh. get on cam? I yes. mean, give us, and also give us an example maybe that you could think of as far as yes. these things. Yes, um, there definitely has been some people that have caught me off guard. Um, there was, uh, I think the first, when I first started camming in 2011, I had never seen a guy that had a metal chastity on his privates. And it happened the first month I was camming. And I was just like... I'm assuming this was in a cam to cam kind of. Yeah. Uh, okay. It was in a private, and I was just like, "Oh my god, what? Do you, you have a cage on it. Like that can't be comfortable. What is going on? You know?" And he wanted me to humiliate him. He wanted me to talk to him like he was the scum of the earth, and I was just like, "Are you comfortable?" But I'm a nice person. Like I don't want to talk to anybody like that. You know? Like I'm Southern hospitality over here. You know? So it was like. 
But that was his fantasy, and I'm very much a pleaser. I want to give people their fantasy, so I remember telling the guy, like, I've never done this before, but I'm going to give it my best shot, but if I'm kind of choppy at this... And he, he thought it was really cute, actually. You know, like, obviously he wanted his fam his fantasy fulfilled, but he thought it was so adorable that I would try, at least. And um, he's still one of my fans today, to this day. And he was back from the very first month. Um, and through getting to know him, you know, he would also bring other fantasies. And we actually got to know each other pretty well via private where sometimes we would just talk and I would ask him, like, how did you even get into that? Like, it, like I, I have to ask the blunt question, like, at what point did you say, I want to put a cage with a lock around my penis uh, and that's, that's going to be something I'm into? Like, I, I just want to understand the psychology of it. And he would go into it with me. And so I've learned so much more about fantasies than I ever thought possible. Because in the industry, you're just told, you're given a script. You're not told what the psychology is behind it or why people are into that. You're just like, oh, okay, that's what they're into. Okay, fine. But when you start to ask somebody like how it came about and you understand it, your brain kind of clicks and you go, oh my God, I totally get it. Like that makes so much sense. And now you can really relate to this person, even though I don't want to put a chastity on me, right? Like I don't have any desire to do that, but I totally get it why somebody else would. And the fact that they're trusting me with that is such a huge turn on and a responsibility that I'm like, wow, like this is really cool. Um, you talk about insightfulness to what makes people tick. You, I would say your emotional intelligence grows astronomically being a cam model. Um, you're dealing with so many different personalities and so many different people. Um, you learn pretty quick, like the, the very intimate parts of people that make them tick. And it's, it's humbling. Do you feel like by even attempting to understand the psyche and where they're coming from, you have solidified these relationships for a lifetime with some mm -hmm. of these fans? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I have definitely a large handful um, of people that have known me from the very start. I know them on a first name basis. I know where they're from. I know what they're up to. I know what they do for work. I know if they're married or not, if they have kids, if they don't, um, what the name of their dog is. I, you know, I know very, very, uh, you know, personal details about them and they do me too. You know, a lot of them, you know, we're not supposed to have, you know, animals on cam, but I will say there's been a couple times that my dog pokes her head in and she jumps up on the bed real quick and I'm like, get off, get out of here. You know what I mean? And they're like, Oh my God, that was your dog for the two <laughs> seconds that I saw her. And I'm like, yeah, that's Daisy. Um, you know, so people learn about me too, and they end up following your social media. Um, I think social media is a very big way for people to know when you are going online. Um, so not only are they learning about you when you're on cam, but they learn about you when you're off cam and what you're posting on social media. And they can comment and they can encourage and they can say, oh my God, that seems amazing. Or this picture is so beautiful. Or I love this outfit. Can you wear it on the next cam show? <laughs> you know, I've had so many different scenarios happen. Um, there's a lot of love and support and relationships that are built with people I've never met, ever. Never been face-to-face -face with these people. And we're talking since 2011. We're talking seven years. I've never met these people in person, but I feel so close to them, and I really do believe that they feel very close to me. And some people may think it's crazy, but I, I consider them friends. I really, really do. I really consider that they know enough about me and I know enough about them that I really believe that they are friends. So is this surreal to you at all? This is your life. It is. It, it kind of is. It, you know, it's hard to explain. I call people outside of the industry civilians because um, I don't know how else to refer to them. But it's, sometimes it can be hard to explain to a civilian that isn't part of that world. They're like, wait, what are you talking about? Like, how could you be friends with somebody that you've never met? And, you know, how can you fulfill fantasies that you're not into? And how can you, you know, and... I don't think everybody's coming from a place of judgment. They're just coming from a place of like, there really is not an understanding. Like it's almost like there is a full blown block there. Like they just, no matter how much you try to explain it, they just don't get it. And 
that's okay. Um, they don't have to get it. At the end of the day, I just, I feel so fortunate. I feel so amazing that not only do I have the friends that I am face to face with, but I also have, I mean, look, I have bad days. I, you know, there's days where I am ecstatic. You know, there's days where like, you know, I've got the best news ever in the entire world, right? But all of my friends are working nine to five jobs here in Dallas, Texas, and I can't say, oh my God, celebrate with me. But I can log online and at any given time, there's going to be somebody that I've known for years. that's going to be like, hey, Rachel, you know, good to see you on. And I'm like, oh my God, I have the best news ever. And I can share it with somebody and they're genuinely happy, you know, for me. Um, the same thing with bad news, you know, um, I, you know, struggled during a time when, you know, one of my dogs passed away and I was just like the pits, right? Like everything reminded me of her. And I was just like, what the hell, you know, I didn't, I was like, oh, and, um, I did, I got on cam. I remember getting on cam and just being like, guys, I'm going to be completely honest with you. Like, I don't feel like stripping today. I don't feel like doing any of that, but like, I just need to engage with people right now. Like I'm kind of sad that my dog died, you know? And I did, I was on cam for two hours. You get so many people from that. They're phenomenal people. They really are. They're human beings on the other end of that screen. So there, there is a, a mutual benefit there. It's yeah. not just all sexual. Even. No, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Not at all. At least not for me. Not the way that you know I've done uh, my camming. Um, I try to be very open and answer questions, um, especially now. Like I am seven years in. I would say the first year that I started camming, it would I would be like, "What do you mean? Why do you want? Why do you want to know what area of Dallas isn't Dallas good enough that I told you that's where I live? Why do you need to know what area? What are you shocking me? Like, you know?" And I would get kind of freaked out, you know, or they would ask you if I had siblings, and I'm, I was kind of like, why, "Like, why does that matter to you?" But over time, I realized that camming is about being more intimate with them than I think any other aspect, right? Like as an exotic dancer, you, you know, you can learn things about people, but usually you see them for one night and you never see them again, right? Um, on set, you never learn about anything about your fans, right? There's no fans on set to learn about. You're learning about talent and people that you work with that are filming it. Social media, you might get to know people, but you're limited to a character limit. It's not like I can sit here and have a full-blown conversation back and forth. You know, I mean, think about how much can you actually type in 15 minutes. Probably not very much, but say you're camming and you go private with somebody for 15 minutes you can actually learn a lot about somebody in 15 minutes and then add that up once a week over weeks and months at a time, you can actually really start to get to know somebody. Would you say that even through camming then, that has allowed you to learn more about even your the demographic of your fan base? Oh my God, absolutely. What do you feel like that looks like as far as your fan base is concerned? Who's your biggest, I guess, quote unquote, target market? I definitely say that um, English speaking, um, the age, English speaking in the age range definitely is between like 18 to like 45, which is, is pretty huge market actually in the grand scheme of it all. But I'm always pleasantly surprised when I get somebody like even last night, um, there's somebody from Germany, um, avid fan, um, speaks pretty fair English, right? Um, but he's an avid fan and he's from Germany and I'm like, wow, yeah. that, I, I'm like blown away. Or if I get someone from Switzerland or you know, I get somebody from Australia and it's so flattering to be like, holy crap. Like I, I am worldwide here. Like this is, this is awesome. <laughs> you know, people from all over the world get on these campsites and they, you know, reach out to you. And then, you know, I've had anything from an 18 year old kid that's still a virgin and is like, I'm horny or I, you know what, actually like I, can you teach me stamina and blah, 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 you know, people want to learn how to be better lovers too. Like, so it's not just about them getting their rocks off either. A lot of the times, you know, I can't tell you how many times a guy is like, I want to see you play with yourself because I want to learn what a girl likes. Like, I just want to be able to watch you because I want to see what a girl actually likes. And I think that that's very fascinating too. Um, and then I can get a guy that is retired and 70 years old and he wants companionship. He wants online companionship. Maybe he doesn't have companionship anywhere else. Or maybe he's a 70-year-old guy that's horny. <laughs> you get all of them. Really? I mean, it's it's amazing. 
it, it's the, it really is hard to put it into a demographic. I mean, because like I said, okay, so English speaking, I mean, what that's UK, that's Australia, that's Canada, that's America, that's, you know, like, there's a lot of English speaking countries out there. And then 18 to 45, that's a pretty large swing of an age group. Um, but then there's also everybody outside of that too that, you know, <laughs> It's maybe it's perhaps different things about yourself, even not necessarily limited to just your physical attributes that mm -hmm. tap into the different markets across the board. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, there was a really cool thing that I did. So I, um, one, oh my God, this was so fun. So I decided to go backpacking um, through Central America. And what I told my fans was I was going to cam, you know, two or three nights during the week. So I was going to stay at hostels and all of that. And two to three nights a week, I would actually get a hotel that had good internet and I would cam and that was going to pay for my trip. And I was gone for six weeks. Okay, girl, I'm talking like backpacking. Like this is 40, serious. Very serious. 40 pound backpack, hitchhiking, staying in hostels. And I went all through Central America, like everything, right? And um, it was insane how many of my cam fans were following my entire trip like literally looking forward to when I was going to get online and tell them like what did I see and what country I was in and where I was at and you know a lot of them even um, bought me all kinds of stuff on my wish list like they actually bought my 40 pound backpack because they were like so excited to be on this adventure with me and you know it, it was it was just the most amazing experience and you know people were living by curiously through through me like um I went to Honduras. I was actually held at gunpoint at one time. Like, it was scary as shit, but the guy was so poor, he just wanted money. I don't even know if his gun had bullets in it, to be completely honest. Like, he was so frail and just emancipated, kind of like, like just, you could tell he was hungry, right? And I remember, like, somebody on cam told me, do not put all your money in one place. Like, make sure you hide it in various places. So mm -hmm. if you do, you know, because Central America can be a dangerous place. And I was so glad I followed his advice, I literally had money underneath my hat and I pulled it open. I pulled out a hundred dollar bill and the guy saw the hundred dollar US bill and just grabbed it and took off running. And you know, I was telling them about it and everybody's like, Oh my God, I'm so glad that you're safe. And that was such a good idea. We're so glad that you did that. And you, you know, because what if I pulled out, you know, the thousand dollars cash that I had on me, right. And I would have lost everything and you know, whatever, um, which would have put me in a bad situation. But you know, that was one of the coolest experiences I had for six solid weeks. You know, all of these people were literally just waiting. Okay, guys, I got the hotel. I'm going to be on in a few hours to tell you all about my, you know, what I've been doing the last few days. And these people would get on and just tell me everything. It was so cool. So you don't hesitate to share then mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, so segueing from that, I mean, let's talk about a little bit more about your life off camp. Okay. So, as of now, like with relationships and whatnot, are you are you in an intimate relationship? Are you in anything serious right mm -hmm. now? And also, what are your aspirations then for the future? I um, I'm not in a relationship, um, and I haven't been for a while. I would say it's definitely easier for me to not be in a relationship. Um, as much as I travel, like. It'd be really hard for someone to be in a relationship with me. I mean, I'm constantly traveling. I'm constantly gone. Um, I'm running my business. Even when I am home, I'm kind of playing catch up. Um, Has that been kind of a thorn in your side with previous relationships as far as the amount of travel? and? Definitely. I mean, that's hard on anybody long term. I mean, a relationship is about being in close proximity to each other and being able to engage with each other on a regular basis and intimacy and all of that. But if I'm gone two, three, four weeks at a time, that can get difficult and it can be wearing on somebody, you know, as well. Um, and then not to mention what I'm doing. It's like, it's not like I'm just like, hey, I'm going to Thailand for a month or something like that. No, I'm going to LA so I can have sex on set with, you know, all of the, all these various companies. Um, by the way, I'll be home in four weeks and then I'll be able to be intimate with you. That's a hard pill to swallow, you know. Um, somebody would have to be very confident and very understanding and um, really take the time 
to get to know the business and ask questions and be able to be vulnerable with their feelings and because it will bring out your insecurities. I think being with somebody that is a sex worker, it, if there's some insecurities that you didn't even know you had, it's going to bring them out. Um, and that takes a lot of vulnerability, a lot of transparency for someone to be able to face that with courage and have an open conversation about it. So I definitely would say I've been single most of my career. Um, there's a few people that have stuck it out for a bit of time with me, um, but it didn't work out. <laughs> um, maybe one day I'll find somebody that it does work out with. I'm definitely open to it. I'm hopeless romantic at heart. I really do um, want to be married one day um, with the right person. I'm just, I'm very selective. I'm very picky. So that would have to be a very, very exceptional person. So, do you think that it would be easier to date someone within the industry just because they have that kind of understanding? They know how everything works and what to expect. There's pros and cons of both sides. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer to date outside of the industry. Um, not to say that I rule it completely out, um, dating inside the industry, but there's pros and cons to both. Like, pros to dating somebody in the industry, they understand right like they get that there it is work and when i go on set it doesn't mean that i'm trying to have sex with this guy in the shower after we just finished our scene and go out to dinner with him and you know be texting him afterwards like once the scene is done it's done you know and somebody within the industry would understand that um they also understand what it's like to have fans and being in the middle of a very nice dinner possibly with family and an avid fan sees you and recognizes you and interrupts the family dinner to come over and oh my god I'm a huge fan and I saw your big anal butts number three can I take a picture with you uh, hold on mom dad be right back let me let me just go take this pic real quick like sometimes I am blown away at like the wow but they're so excited, you know what I mean? And they didn't mean to be intrusive. They were so ecstatic to even just see you that they they're, they thought that's their last opportunity to get a picture with you. And they were thinking in a very different place than even probably noticing who you were sitting with. A guy or a girl in the industry is going to fully understand that because they've gotten it before yeah. and it's happened to them before. And they've had to have the awkward conversation of, hold up sorry I'll be right back just ignore that that little thing just happened and I'll be right back you know what I mean um they'll understand whereas a civilian when you get with a civilian and they've never been with somebody that has a huge following the first time that that happens and you're at dinner with them they're kind of like that would freak anyone out. yeah like whoa whoa hold like is this really like we're at dinner you know what I mean like is this really going down um, and that takes patience. You know, it also takes patience for them because I don't care how hard they try to understand to a certain level. They're never really going to fully understand how it is on set, mm -hmm. you know, and how that dynamic is with the other talent. They'll try their best, but they, if you haven't seen it, it, it's so hard to explain it. You know, like I don't even think, uh, companies that roll BTS, even have a full scope of just exactly how that dynamic is between me and the director, me and the male talent, me and the female talent, me and the photographer. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a photographer that's six inches from your cooter saying, show me the pink. Well, I mean, over years, you're going to get kind of close with that photographer, but it's, it's a close working relationship. It doesn't mean that like he's going home to my pictures and you know, then hitting me up and being like, oh my God, I'm staring at your pictures. Go out with me. Is that, has jealousy like, been something that you've had to deal with in the past with relationships? Absolutely. I think, but I think a better word for it is insecurities that creep up because I think that there's a, there's a difference between jealousy and insecurity and it's a fuzzy line because they can cross over each other. Right. But I think a lot of it is fear which, you know, there's an acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. You know, so you have this fear in your mind of what it's going to be on set or what it might be on set or how I'm interacting with people on set, but you don't know for sure 
and you're worried about it. And so you bring those worries in and it limits you from opening up yeah. or being so vulnerable with me. You kind of keep this wall up with me and I'm over here going, what's your problem? Like, you know, why can't you just figure it out? And they're like, well, I'm sorry. This is my first rodeo. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to get around the curve here. It takes so much patience. It really does. Relationships are really hard in this industry. Um, you are poking things in people that, like I said, they didn't even know was there. Um, and it's challenging to have, it's challenging to have the patience to work with somebody through those things that come up. Um, because sometimes it's not fair. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not fair that I'm on set and you're calling my phone and you're freaking out right now, or you're texting my phone or that, you know, you tell me, look, you know, I love you, but I, I just, I need a day to process this. I'm going to be okay in a day, but I like, you've been gone for four weeks and I just, I just, I need to re register my brain for a day to get back in sync with you, which I have a ton of respect for. Like you need a day, got it. But that also takes a lot of courage and respect on my part to honor that person's wishes. Even though I, all I, all I can think about is I just want to be in their arms right now and I just want to have sex with them and I want to go to dinner and I want to cuddle and I want to do all these things. Right. But I have to honor them and give them that space to recalibrate their brain and be like, okay, you know, she's back. Have you tried any of the you know, online dating platforms. Absolutely. Would we see you on Tinder or, or KeepIt? Absolutely. <laughs> I've been on Tinder, Bumble, Inner Circle. Um, what do people say then? As soon as they see your picture, oh my God. You know. I, I get both. I get some people that recognize me right off the bat. I get some people that kind of tiptoe around it. They're like, you look really familiar. Um, and some people will be like, oh my God, you could be Rachel Starr's twin. Do you know who that is? And I'm like, well there's that uh well how do I break this down for you thank you so much that's such a huge compliment yeah you know um and uh so you so I get all of it um and then there's people that I will talk to for weeks on a dating thing, finally meet up with them. They still haven't put two and two together. Don't have a clue. And then I end up having to say, you know, the, it comes up. What do you do for work? Well, I'm a porn star. Really? Oh, are you serious? Are you just fucking with me right now? Yeah. And I'm like, no, like I'm serious. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. How long? Oh, almost 12 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know? And then it's like the whole dynamic kind of changes it's a shocking thing to say. I mean, how many times are you going to go out on a date with somebody and, you know, you're looking for some, a dental assistant, a secretary, I, you know, work insurance, I sell homes, I'm a porn star. Oh. So does the, <laughs> does it, does, does the ball stop rolling there then after that date, after you come out mm -hmm. to them and you tell them? No, um, not usually. There's, there's been two times where I've literally, the second that I told somebody they had no idea and they were like, Okay. Um, wow. Uh, well, I think that kind of concludes this. Um, I, we should check out. And I'm like, oh, okay. okay. And I've literally had like two people, only two, that actually got up and was like, I'm not down. Uh -huh. I'm going to leave this uh -huh. situation. Honestly, and I, you know what? And I respect that. Rather than somebody staying and being uncomfortable, I would much rather somebody break it right then and say, you know what? That doesn't align with me. I'm out. Like, I'm not going to take it personal. Got it. Cool. At the same time, you're not backing down on what you're doing either. No, Just I'm not going to hide what I'm doing. Um, I think that there's a time and a place to say it. I don't scream it from the rooftops. Um, but in the same sense, like if somebody asks me directly what I do, I'm going to tell them. Um, I'm not ashamed of my job in any way. I'm very grateful. And I think that I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this industry. I wouldn't be where I'm at. Like, so I hold it with a lot of pride. And if somebody doesn't like it, Hey, that's okay. But I just weeded you out of what's going to be compatible with me pretty quick anyway. So we're good. <laughs> you know, from what I understand, you are an intimacy coach and mm -hmm. you are, so you're working with people one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Give us a little bit more information about that. 
So that started um, through osmosis of my social media, people asking me questions, how could they be a better lover? How could they have better stamina? Um, how could they give oral better? Um, girls were reaching out to me and saying, you know, my boyfriend loves watching you. Can you teach me how to shake your ass like you do? Can you teach me how to talk dirty? Um, and, and so that I started getting these questions over and over again. And I'm like, I need to figure out a way to make this happen, you know, where I can coach these people. So I, um, designed a website. Well, I didn't personally design it. I had somebody to design it, design my website, get it launched, code it and launch it, um, which is called the rachelstar.com. And that's where people can go on my website. My website is not triple X. It's, there's no hardcore content on it whatsoever. It's literally just kind of like a business card, almost like a place for someone to go and they can book me for coaching and consulting and intimacy coaching. So I do coaching for people that want to get into the industry, individuals that want to get into the industry, whether that's camming or porn or whatever aspect of it it is. I do consulting for businesses that are already within the industry or looking to get into the industry. And then I do intimacy coaching. Um, and so I do all three of those, which brings a lot of them together a lot of the times. You know, a lot of them kind of intersect, but uh, the intimacy coaching has by far been the most rewarding um, because again, here it is, I'm learning really deep into what makes people tick and what's important to them. You know, when I get a girl um, that is like, I've been with my boyfriend for two years and I like so badly, I want to learn how to give a blowjob where he'll actually come from it, but he just can't come from my blowjobs. But like, I really want to surprise him with the fact that like I can do it. And I'm like, like, girl, you're pulling my heartstrings right now. Like, I will teach you how to give a good blowjob. <laughs> you know? Women, and, do women need just as much help as yes. they see sometimes, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I find it so endearing. It's adorable to me, you know? And then I have, you know, I also have girls on there that are like, I don't know what to do because... I want to make love, but my boyfriend wants to pull my hair and spank me and he wants to call me a dirty slut. And I just, I feel so degraded by it and I don't know what to do, but he only does it during sex. And when it's not sex, he opens my doors and he takes me out to dinner and I want to marry him, you know? And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to have to break down some psychology for you. <laughs> But I try to help them find an even medium with it. So he, her man can feel satisfied, but she can also get some satisfaction too. It's give and take, right? Same thing with guys. You know, I have guys that are like, I cannot seem to last past five, 10 minutes to save my life. It doesn't matter if I have a condom on. It doesn't matter if I use numbing cream. It doesn't matter what, like, I just cannot last a very long time. What can I do? And what a lot of people don't realize is, I have to know what your diet is. I have to know what, how many times are you masturbating? How are you masturbating? You know, um, what turns you on? What are you into? What, what, what are the scenarios that this is happening in? I have to dig kind of deep to fix those situations, you know, and help you with that. And then there's other people that are like, I want to learn everything there is to know about the female anatomy and her coming. I want to know about her G-spot. I want to know how to make her squirt. I want to know how to eat her pussy. I want to know how to, like, I want to know how to do everything, you know? And you're like, okay, well, how many sessions are you going to book here? Because I can't fit this all in on one hour, <laughs> right? Um, so I kind of get all of it, but it happened through osmosis. Really, all of it started coming on my uh, social media platforms. And I just realized like there is a need here, there's a market and people genuinely want to know and they value my expertise of being in the business for so long. They feel comfortable talking to me rather than going to a sexologist. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but sometimes you can kind of feel like that lab coat, like yeah. someone kind of, like it's almost too clinical. And, um, and I think with me being younger, they feel that they can relate to me and just doing what I do that it's a judgment free zone. They can ask me anything. But if they're going to come to you mm -hmm. seeking it, seeking advice or help, then mm -hmm. they need to be ready to be open. Yes. Right? Yeah, absolutely. There's only so much I can help you if you're only <laughs> going to give me tidbits of information. <laughs> you so, get what you put in basically. Rachel, what's next for you in the next three to five years? Where do you see yourself? Uh, next three to five years. Um, well, I'm definitely still filming. I film about 20 movies a year or 20 scenes a year. 
um, sometimes more or less, a little bit, um, that's definitely gonna keep going. Um, so I definitely have plans to keep filming. Definitely still camming. My website, I'm just trying to nurture right now to really take the coaching consulting and intimacy coaching as far as I can take it. Um, as of recently, the contracts haven't been signed. We're in the process of writing them up, but um, I'm looking into possibly breaking into the fitness industry as well. Oh, so fitness has been a very big passion of mine um, to stay fit and healthy, nutrition, all of that. Um, and that's something that my avid fans know, um, but maybe just the average fan hasn't really known like just how important that's been to me as far as like detox resorts, all different kinds of nutrition and diet, um, workout routines, all of that. That's been a very big part of my life. Um, and so there's possibly um, two partners that I might have that would really help advance into bringing me over into that side that they have a lot of experience with it. So I'm excited about that. Um, and other than that, um, probably continuing to invest in real estate. <laughs> All of the money that I make in this industry, I kind of um, diversify between my financial portfolio to just keep building um, assets um, for longevity. Um, I'd love to say that I could stay filming in this industry forever, but at some point it's going to be time to, you know, put it as a, as a, as a picture, a little frame on the wall of something that I used to do or on the mantle. Um, but for now, I think that I definitely have a good five, 10 more years in the business and I plan on milking it for everything I can get out of it, girl. <laughs> Rachel, thank you so much for talking with us today and and for talking with Streamate as well. Absolutely. So where can your fans find you if they want to connect with you, whether it's for intimacy coaching as well as on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so you can definitely, the best place that I can tell you to go to is therachelstar.com. It has my social media links on there. Um, it has my coaching. It has everything on there. So therachelstar.com is the number one place to go. Like I said, there's no hardcore content on there, but it really is just a place that, you can find out what events I'm doing, what my tour dates are, what clubs I'm going to, what my schedule is, when I'm on cam, even, you know, I have it where if I'm live on Streamate, it blinks and flashes that I'm live on there, so you can go straight to it. Um, that's the best way. I'm on Instagram, at Rachel Star. I'm on Twitter, which is at Rachel Star Triple X. I'm on Facebook, which a lot of people seem to not know, um, and that is The Real Rachel Star. Um, is what that one is. Um, but I think my website would be the best place. Honestly, that's where you're going to find out all the information of what I'm up to and where I'm going and how to get in touch with me.